everybody. I'm Pastor AJ Houseman, and welcome to 10 Foot Pole, a podcast dig deeper into aspects of the Bible that get glossed over or totally ignored in most preaching. The Bible has a lot of parts that are racy, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright horrifying. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 22. Today, our guest is the Reverend Dave Glenn Burns, who is the campus minister at Three House, which is a collaborative collaborative ministry at the University of Northern Iowa. I love that you waved. This is a podcast. They can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waving at you. I'm waving uh, well, at thanks. you. It's good to see you. <laughs> Um, I, Dave is an old colleague of mine when I served at the, the Lutheran Student Center and Lutheran Campus Ministries at the University of Northern Iowa. Um, and so I appreciate you taking time um, to come and, you know, share in our podcast. It's good to see you. It's great to be here with you, AJ. This is, I've been looking forward to this from your invitation. Great. Good. Hey, could you share with us a little bit about the Three House? Because when I say collaborative ministry, that people may not totally understand, you know, what we're talking about here. Well, yes. Um, when we worked together, when we were colleagues, you were the campus minister at the Lutheran Student Center at UNI, and I was the campus minister at the Wesley Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, Wesley and Foundation people... is typically um, is associated with the United Methodist Church. Correct. To which, Correct. to which Dave is a United Methodist pastor. I my credential as clergy is through the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. um, along the way, we offered space for the Presbyterian campus ministry and the Episcopal. What the Presbyterians were doing their campus ministry out of a congregation, mm -hmm. but without a building, and the Episcopal was on behalf of the the Iowa diocese but without a building so we that we offered them space next to campus uh which was a couple blocks from the Lutheran student center mm -hmm. and uh they each did their own campus ministry and then we started realizing it might be a it would be sadly creative but also effective if we would collaborate on some things so we did some things together mm -hmm. And then uh, in time, the Disciples of Christ congregation wanted to serve the students and the university community. So they uh, began being interested in collaborating with us. And then the... the Something the, very the, sad the, happened. And then the sad thing was when uh, the Lutheran Student Center board at the time did an assessment of the facilities and usefulness and how much would be uh we don't have to go into all the details you're saying uh, it nicely there, there there were there were requirements uh for where people could sleep or stay and housing and how to get it up to code and some of that kind of stuff yeah uh, so the board decided to sell it. They had an opportunity. The university actually bought it. Mm -hmm. University University of Northern Iowa purchased the the property, and uh, so we invited the campus ministry, the Lutheran campus ministry, to come be part of our collaboration. And I thought mm -hmm. it would make the whole thing stronger, rather than what would that be five or six small, you know, struggling along independent campus ministries, couldn't we do something better? And if we sort of, if we see the world similarly in terms of ministry or figure out how we can work together well. So yeah, we decided to start collaborating. Yeah. And you, the Lutheran Student Center, we still use the coffee house equipment that was part of the Luth the LSC. Mm -hmm. uh, we have coffee house every Tuesday and Thursday night in the lobby that. of of our building. So it's a, it's a key part of our ministry right now. It makes me so happy that that ministry lives on. And and we are very deliberate uh, and intentional in saying that we are the Lutheran campus ministry at UNI 
and we're the Methodist campus ministry at UNI, and we're the Episcopal campus ministry at UNI, and the Disciples and the Presbyterian. We're, we are affiliating with uh, UKirk is the Presbyterian network, mm -hmm. and um, the Lutheran, Lou Men and Lutheran Lumen. campus ministry. Uh, yeah, so we're, we feel like we're stronger in this collaboration, showing collaboration. Yeah, I love that. I and you know, it's a it's a great ministry and a, and a great spot. You know, right on the top of College Hill. Well, and, and you can we throw serve... water balloons at the president. Yes, <laughs> uh, it it might have been done already, but right now we want to stay on good terms with the president because supposedly he plays cribbage, oh. and some of us play cribbage. He th he claims he's competitively plays cribbage. Uh, so we want to have a cribbage match, a grudge cribbage match with the president. We'll see if that happens. That would be awesome but, if, if campus ministries got to play cribbage with the president. It feels like that we set ourselves up, positioning ourselves to be really most effective doing campus ministry at UNI, given the current context and the world that we're living in. Mm -hmm. uh, we're the, we're the, most uh, welcoming, affirming, including uh, mainline for whom though for those for whom that's important. Um, you know, we think we celebrate questions. We talk about vocation. Yeah, we're a safe place. Yeah, so all of those things. Yeah, and um, that's you know that's. That's also part of the identity of the Wesley Foundation. You guys have been, uh, you know, doing a great job of being welcoming, open and affirming, like long, long before, um, you know, many other of those denominations or, you know, campus ministries, you know, doing that. Yeah. And, and that's been in spite of some of the official denominational positions over the years, but, yes. but our, but our, um, our approach has been to be welcoming mm -hmm. of every, you know, we've had times where we've had a strong reach outreach with the international community and mm -hmm. with the LGBT community. And we're doing some things with the neurodiverse community, you know, we're, wherever we see the opportunity to represent God or love, like, like we learn about God through Jesus. Mm -hmm. that. Um, that you know we're not only trying to attract the leaders and the beautiful people but we want to sort of think there's room for us to love everybody in some way yeah that sounds to me like what you what what should be you know sort of the mission especially in a, in a campus ministry that that makes sense to me yeah yeah great all right well um Dave and I are going to talk about the gospel lesson, um, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 14, for Sunday, May 7th, for those who are planning on going to church or, you know, especially going to a church that follows the revised common lectionary. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and dive into this gospel lesson. Very, very John heavy this Easter season. Good images. You know, yeah. we'll go with the images. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to read John chapter 14, verses 1 to 14 from the New Revised Version Updated Edition. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am there, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, 
Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> you know... I've actually never preached this on a Sunday, but I have preached it at several funerals. It's a very, very common funeral. It, up through uh, verse four or verse, usually in the funeral liturgy, it's we don't necessarily always read through some of the verses. You know, we we like to talk about the, there's many places, mm -hmm. but then we we get uncomfortable with uh, a couple verses in there. Yeah, we do. Um, I think particularly verse six, right? Jesus says to him, I am yeah. the way, the truth, and yeah. the life. No one comes to yeah. the father except through me. Um, this is one of those verses in the Bible that like, you can read this one way and it's beautiful and it's glorious. And then you read it another way and you kind of like, Oh, this is one of those crappy things that Christians say uh, that makes it very exclusionary. And why have we in the church become so good at taking a moment of grace and uh, turned it into rigid law and exclusionary? I mean, so good at that. We've become so it, good at that. Yeah, it's almost like it's baked into being an institution or something like that. Yeah. Um, and but, I think you just named it just that, that like it should be this moment of grace. It should be, you know, an invitation, but rather it always comes out as law. Yeah, I, I bump into this uh, often when, you know, if, if we who are uh doing ministry or part of a community that tries to be radically welcoming and loving and uh are working on being in community with a lot of people uh there here at our campus there's campus ministries that will real quickly talk to the students and say well you know that there is just one way yeah. and and we'll be happy to tell you what that one way is. And it's like, okay, let's let's dig a little deeper into this scripture and see what what's there. So, you know, some of this, yeah, I look at this and I think, um, I like to I like to do lectio divina mm -hmm. to you're gonna have I'm to explain to that. It. Okay, lectio divina is a method of uh, scripture reading and learning and inspiring where you hear it or read it one time and just listen to what the words are that, you know, are there any words or phrases that speak to you hmm. or jump out to you and then uh, sit with that a little bit and then hear it or read it again and maybe what is God trying to say to me? What do I see in here that might be uh, something from God? So it's it's a matter of reading it several times to mm -hmm. see, for me, I don't follow it strictly. I would not pass the test to be a spiritual director with the exact, but it's a method where uh, we, we listen to the same readings and find uh, ourselves drawn. So in preparing for here today, that verse six jumped out at me, but only after the verse one, where Jesus says to the, the people gathered, 
uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. And I'm thinking, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, they're, they were hoping for a Messiah and he got killed. And, and then the women came and said that he, um, yeah, they were, they, they, Jesus is setting up this, this remarkable experience he's all the time trying to help them understand what will be but they're not they don't get it yeah well so let's set up the context for this conversation i think sometimes this always can be a little confusing when we come to it in a different part of the church year rather than like where we're exactly like in jesus's journey so like you know we're post-easter right now jesus is is walking around doing his post-resurrection uh ministry until we get um you know to ascension day um and so right now um but but this takes place before jesus's death so this is in the last room they're in the upper room having the last supper um it's about the time in the meal which by the way this is a really long narrative in the gospel of john their feet jesus has already cleaned their feet so it's you know kind of weird already like they're already like what's happening um jesus has just called peter out like no you're gonna deny me three times um and then you know he also just called out judas and judas left right so this is where they're sitting there's now you know just a lot of crazy things are happening and so like of course they're kind of scared like the political climate's kind of you know getting in, getting a little out of control um they kind of see some of the writing on the wall and so when jesus starts saying some of these things it's like what 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 are we doing what's happening jesus what do you mean you're going to leave? We don't know where you're going. Yeah, show us the way. What what do you mean by this? And and I heard a uh, this year in in preparations, I heard one uh I think Old Testament theologian who talked about actually in terms of messiahs, they he was talking about how uh the Christian faith and and the Jewish faith or Judaism both were looking for messiahs Mm -hmm. and um so to keep in mind that jesus comes out of the jewish faith and so these were the people were all still part of the jewish tradition their scriptures were the torah the the first books of the old testament Mm -hmm. they they were looking for a messiah so they had come into jerusalem expecting a you know a powerful jesus was going to yeah they're looking for a revolution right like they're looking for yeah, that they're looking figure for to rev- follow yeah and that hasn't happened yet and this this theologian said actually in terms of messiahs jesus was kind of disappointing he's not he's not overpowering he's not all of the macho messiah that's going to come in and you know, yeah, do all of this. I, you know, I actually read something really interesting um, recently, and, and I think I shared it on like last week or a couple weeks ago on the podcast um, about um, the character the, uh, of who Barabbas was um, and actually mm-hmm. the fact that he was all, he was like a, a political revolutionary. He was inciting political riots and stuff. And so in the city, when it's time to release one or the other, these people are looking for someone who's going to be this like revolutionary that's going to go and break down doors and do all those things. And so that's motivation to release that guy over this very passive, um, peaceful leader in Jesus, that 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 like that's an intentional like there's there is such like the atmosphere is so hot and ripe with this political tension that that's the kind of leader that they were looking for. And Jesus wasn't living up to that. And it was, it must have been an awful time. Things in, you know, the historical research of that time was that this was a pretty oppressive Mm -hmm. time and how tempting it is to follow the, the big and powerful leader uh, and here, Jesus, all the way along his story, has been with these folks, showing them a different way, a, mm-hmm. a, a whole different way of living their faith. So when he says things like, you know where I am going, this is not new information. I've been talking, we've been on this journey, we're on the way to, I've been showing you with my examples 
you know, I've been hearing uh, um, the, you know, I think this is another example of like the disciples taking what Jesus says literally rather yep. than understanding him speaking in his figure, figure of speech that, that he is, that this is more of a meta that he is trying to give them, like, understand, like I'm the metaphorical way, right. Rather than yeah. like this physical, like they're like this, this way here, this uh, it's Hodos would be like a street, a path. Right. And so they're like, no, 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 we don't know what street it's on. You have to, you have to tell us. And for him to kind of like try to say, no, this is the way. Yeah. And they, they kind of wanted to be, well, tell me that he says, no, I'm not talking about traveling. I'm talking about transformation. Yeah. Not about destinations. It's about discovering uh, you're already at home with God. As you've been following me, I've been with God. So in our, one of the ways that I think about campus ministry, if I can bring that into at this point, Good. yeah, I love the image that Brian McLaren talks about as a school of love, hmm. the Christian faith as a school of love, uh, where we're, we're following God in the way of Jesus by learning to love ourselves learning to love each other, uh, learning to love our neighbor, those that we know it's easy. Some people it's really easy to love. And then there are neighbors that are really hard to love, learning to love them. And then to learn all of creation in, as we are able to learn to love, uh, that's when we discover, Hey, you know what? This is what Jesus is talking about. We're with God. This is living in the style of love. So, you know, the church has done a whole lot um, accidentally or well-intentioned to cause trauma hmm. by going for, like the, some of the disciples in here, They we start getting in to who's in and who's out. And we start yeah. worrying about a legalistic understanding of uh this there's only one way to be Christian or to be a person of faith. Um, it almost makes Jesus sound like a separationist. Can I say? Uh, yeah. So this this idea uh, through that also, I kind of think of um, an example that kind of came to mind. Um, if if you're a watcher of the Mandalorian, um, first of all, that the Mandalorians, um, it, it's Star Wars for people who don't know. It's one of the Star Wars shows um it's the the mandalorians like they're like their faith they always like this is the way that's what they say they're like catchphrase their creed this is the way um and in the current season the mandalorian there's all these different like tribes so you'll have more like orthodox ones and you'll have more like reformed mandalorians and them you know sort of having this same you know religion culture um but experiencing it differently and having to figure out how to work together it's um it's very fascinating as as sort of an example we actually in this most recent season um i think there are some really direct lines with um sort of them kind of honestly i think they are supposed to be representative of sort of like the jewish community um and the anti-semitism that happened as far as like the empire imposing on the mandalorians um just as a anyways so so that's sort of the language that like i i hear with some of this too um Mm -hmm. but just to think of it too like also that like their thing is they have some people like the more orthodox tribe that take everything very like legalistically whereas like the more uh the reformed tribes are like no this is you know this is this this is not quite what this is meant to you know be um and sometimes i wonder if like we kind of run into that same issue um i i think when i think of the difference between um folks that really read the Bible very like, you know, literalist that like word for word, this is exactly, you know, law. Um, and, you know, a, a perspective of understanding like, wait a minute, but like there, there is the law. So we talk about the law, right. And then um, not everything in the Bible is law. This isn't meant to be, you know, we have the commandment, right. And Jesus said, I give you this new commandment. That's the law, right. This is different this is 
an, an explanation. This is the way in which Jesus shows and offers the grace. You with me? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm letting that, I'm sitting with that because one of the cool uh, commentator commentaries that I've read uh, wanting to dig into this more described this passage is as one of the most beautiful non-dual inclusive passages of teachings by Jesus. Uh, all of the, if we, if we have ears to hear it, all the divisions are healed in Jesus. There's unity and accommodation mm. for all. There's no need to go anywhere for Jesus has already come to us. I think he's saying, I'm, I'm here. All of these differences, if we're, if we're uh, realizing that God is with us, there's no need to search any further for the right answers. Uh, you're home. Yeah. I'm I'm with you. Uh, Which makes Richard sense in a Johannine inter understanding of like this new life. The the Zoe is a here and now thing, and not like an after you die thing. Yeah, Richard Rohr, when responding to somebody uh who was presented presenting the but it says i am the way and the truth and the life no one uh, you know mm -hmm. there's only this one right way he says when jesus said i am the way the truth and the life it means that you are not you don't have to be you're not yeah. you, don't, you don't have to be god it's a reminder that to the disciples i think that they don't have to be god is already with them you know all of us are reminders so we um talked about a couple of weeks ago um when we talked about um the so-called doubting thomas text um mm -hmm. of remembering that that god's doing all of the hard work right this is you yeah, know i think that goes exactly. along with it right god's the one that's doing all the work and i and i really hear this as a strong invitation uh for those who are trying to follow jesus following in uh, the paths of love and compassion, grace and hope. Uh, I think the invitation is for us to live that way. That's some of doing uh, when Jesus says uh, you'll do even greater works than those that I've accomplished. You know, I think the invitation is for us to see that as we're loving ourselves, others, mm -hmm. all of creation, uh, that's, that's connecting with, this um this invitation i was trying to think of a, there's hopefulness in this yeah uh i have a but there but yeah oh no you can you can keep going well no i because it it feels like in a in a world where a lot of the churches seem to be wanting to give the answers wanting to tell everybody what you know if i'm the pastor I think there's uh, some of some of our colleagues think that our job is to provide the answers. Mm. And if we look at Jesus, I think that our model is to show how how we can be loving and providing hopefulness and uh, inviting that more than believing the right doctrine. Yeah, we, you know, I don't know. That could be my Methodistness coming out. In well, that, I was going to say, a, I, that's a lot of conversation that I know that you're involved in right now um, and what's and what's happening in um, the United Methodist Church, for sure. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, so boil for, down to some elements. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's I was right. just going to kind of bring in an audience that maybe um, aren't as familiar with what's happening in the United Methodist Church right now. So the United Methodist Church um, is going through a process um, where churches kind of are going to individually decide whether or not they're going to stay in the United Methodist Church. Is that kind of how it, it you, you explain it better? You obviously know more about yes. this than I do. Well, yes, but each congregation does not have to choose it's getting okay. pitched in in the politics of this it's oh. getting pitched to each congregation that they have to choose if we look oh. the name methodist 
started out with John, the brothers, John and Charles Wesley, who were mm -hmm. in the Church of England, who, and it started, the Methodist movement started on a college campus. I mean, that always speaks to me. Um, and they were trying to practice their faith. You know, they would meet for communion. They would, uh, for acts of charity, acts of compassion, and acts of mercy, but it was to to keep their faith alive, uh, starting out on the campus. Um, but it was within the context of the larger church. So people made fun of how methodical they went about it. And that's where the name Methodist came from. It was a method more than setting up to be a church. So they so it was it was assumed for a long time that it would be part of the Church of England. Okay, in the 1700s, there were some things happening in the colonies, so they came to the United States, or the colonies, and uh, the the Methodist movement became it, the United Methodist, uh, it's, it's separated, the, the, the Church of England, you know, a lot of the colonies did not want to be part of England, so they started a church, the mm -hmm. Methodist movement has always been about uh, personal piety and social transformation, changing the world. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's sort of a method of how we love the world mm -hmm. boiled down along the way there have, you know, there's beliefs, but the creeds and all that kind of thing are part of the larger church and the, uh, the Methodist movement at its strongest was interested in starting colleges um, starting uh, hospitals, showing the love uh, of God shown us in Jesus where the need was. And so early, early Methodist movements were involved in uh, anti-slavery, abolitionist. Mm -hmm. Methodists have been involved in, in uh, women's suffrage or women's rights uh, over the years. So so there have been actually in the Methodist movement a number of times that people have split off, have disagreed and started new churches. Hmm. So uh, interestingly, in the one of the first to split off was the Wesleyan Methodist. There's still the Wesleyan movement now. They split off because they didn't think that the, the Methodist Episcopal Church was acting fast enough on abolition. So they wanted to address slavery uh and now the social teachings of the wesleyan church and the methodist church have kind of flip-flopped but anyhow yeah i went into the weed i apologize we can <laughs> edit you're that all right out. but but there there's a history of churches or groups separating from the the main channel of the methodist movement in that's, I mean, 60s. that's true of Lutherans too, right? Like there's a bunch of little yeah. Lutheran churches that everyone's yeah. like, I've never heard of that yeah. denomination. I was like, well, at some point in time, they decided they were done with us. So there was, you know, the Methodist Episcopal Church had a group split off because of too much power by the bishop. So there was the Methodist Protestant. And then the Methodist Episcopal Church split because the Methodist Episcopal Church South wanted to con continue slavery and the Methodist Episcopal Church was becoming opposed to that mm -hmm. but then in 1939 those three reunited into the methodist church there was another stream of german pioneers and uh, faith people that formed the the brethren the united brethren the evangelical association a lot of that was in german language uh, on the frontiers in 1968 all of the methodists and the evangelical united brethren church met to form the United Methodist Church mm -hmm. in 1968. Uh, in 1972, the first language that um, the sets up the conflict that's happening now around uh, the LGBT community or or homosexuality, as the language was then, uh, the in the Methodist the the only body that can speak for all of Methodism or United Methodism is the general conference that happens every four years. Hmm. 1972 was the first language uh, put in by a group that were pretty conservative that uh, had 
had been in the 60s opposed to the civil rights movement began turning their attention to the LGBT community. And, uh, you know, I've actually heard that a lot, that that's um, that when I, a lot of what I've read is that when people sort of like very conservative, especially white folks, decided that like, oh, they got to give up on, you know, um, they're going to lose the civil rights stuff that then needed to turn their focus somewhere else. And that's when they yeah, started targeting and, the LGBT and community. And so that's when then every four years, some other language was added and the church began fighting in 1972, 76, 1980, you know, every four years, the United Methodist Church would gather and there were people that were wanting to be welcoming and affirming and there were people that were not wanting that. And so uh, a lot of the, the conservative wing was fueled by outside groups uh, mm. not comfortable with um you know in my mind not pr comfortable with progress there's there's a institute for religion and democracy there there's different different groups that try to influence they you know they want to go to the days when um uh men were the leaders i think that there are people that would not be open to every moment of growth or progress in the church mm -hmm. so so where we're at right now is that for the last several years at general conference there have been more and more people wanting to be fully welcoming so that uh we we loot we give up our language it says uh homosexuality is incompatible with christian teaching mm -hmm. and there's still language in our book of discipline our guidebook uh, that says um, uh, uh, an LGBT person cannot be ordained. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was not getting changed. And some people were fighting and there was all kinds of, of uh, manipulations of the process. And then COVID came and made it impossible to have the general conference uh, of twenty. Neither it should have been uh 2020 was the regular mm -hmm. 2016 2020 the bishops decided we need to deal with this because we're people are saying it's legal to be same-sex marriage and in, in across the country in our you know in our states but the church won't do it and clergy were getting brought up on charges if they would do this so there were people that were uh, defy, openly defying that and a whole lot. So, well, so I would a whole, whole lot because I honestly, in my, you know, anytime for the past, I don't know how many years that I drive by any Methodist church, there was, there was, it was usually like, there was a huge rainbow flag out front and like, like so many, many, many Methodist churches were way more on that progressive and bef before other churches got there. There was a movement in the Methodist Church called the Reconciling Ministries Network, and it was started out. Uh, there has been a strong thread through Methodism of being involved with the social gospel, mm -hmm. with social action, and so in some settings, the Methodist Church was the was the you know the one that was going to be out working with civil rights and yeah and all of that. And that, that went for uh, gender and sexuality. Uh, a lot of churches started listening and meeting their people and realizing there were a lot of LGBT people in their communities and among the clergy. And rather than having to be closeted or hidden, uh, they were starting to say, we understand that God loves all of us. And mm -hmm. so we're going to stand up. Uh, this is so quick. This is not all of the details. It was... There were some things that happened uh, uh, that seemed to break the straw of the more orthodox, conservative, legalistic, who started realizing that they were not going to be able to control the main flow of Methodism and started controlling the narrative. And so you'll have uh, a movement. There was a good news network. There was the Wesleyan Covenant Association. That I've heard of, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so they're all really trying to say that anybody that's inclusive is defying the book of discipline or def going against. And they're saying 
they can't do that. So they try to get people to realize that do, you know, let's, let's stay with what the rules are. There were clergy that wanted to be inclusive, that wanted to be welcoming, but wouldn't because the, the book of discipline said it was not allowed. Uh, and, and so the, the good news movement, the Wesleyan covenant association formed a global Methodist connection in response to uh, not being able to have a general conference to decide once and for all. So they were going to start a, a, a movement of the churches that wanted to hang on to the way it's been the more orthodox, no, yeah. no, no room for LGBT. And they're soliciting individual congregations to kind of leave the United Methodist church and join yeah. their movement. Well, there was a possibility. There was a, there was a Christmas. I don't know if it was a Christmas conference. There was, there was supposed to be a general conference in 2020. And for a while it was possible to think about the church all of the churches deciding, are they going to go with the the centrist position? Are they going to go with the conservative orthodox position or the inclusive? And so mm -hmm. there was money involved and it was going to be a good way. And a lot of people saw that as an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to control. And no, it was for a while, it was looking like the Methodist church might all subdivide. Uh but what actually happened is that this global Methodist, at least as I'm understanding it, the global Methodist movement is leaving the United Methodist Church. Yes. The ordinary United Methodist churches do not have to choose. It's getting represented to them that they do. So they're... So the the people who are in favor of leaving the United Methodist Church are just telling their congregations that that's not actually yeah. they're not being yeah. forced to choose. Uh, you know, uh, between you and me and all the listeners, there's a whole lot of ego driving uh, all of this, and there's a lot of people that. So, like what would you say to someone who's in a congregation whose pastor is like forcing them to choose? There are, first of all, they are a beloved child of God. And mm. yes, it's a, it's a struggle there. You know, the pastor that we disagree with is still a beloved child of God. And yeah. we're still figuring out ways to, but it's not true that a congregation has to choose. They it should be possible for a church to say, we want to be United Methodist. So the one the ones who want to leave could right should be able to we want to leave to go so like the churches that left over slavery over women's suffrage over civil rights you know uh it's part of our methodist history that if we feel strongly that this is not the direction we're gonna go where we can be with people who are like-minded there are the United Methodist Church is going to continue and there will be churches that are, there's a lot of congregations that are, are splitting over this, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because, you know, half there's a, there's a process that has to be followed. And there's a certain percentage of members voting that have to vote affirmatively to disaffiliate. Mm -hmm. So there are churches that are saying, we're split 50 50 so they they're they don't get to leave they don't get to disaffiliate mm. and what do you do then with a congregation that has half of them wanting to stay united methodist and half wanting to leave so th there's a lot of congregations where there's a lot of pain yeah and yeah. conflict so so but but it's not there's misinformation out there frankly sadly well what do you boil down the issue to cuz i what I, I thought it was pretty much it's over um, inclusion of LGBT yeah, clergy yeah, and LGBT. Is. The, there, that's the not global, what that's not what some people are telling their congregations yeah. this is about. The 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 global, but if you look at it, uh, you know if it if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, <laughs> it it probably is a duck, but. Um, yeah, it, that's in there. That's a big part. The, the The leaders of the global Methodist 
movement want to control the story and they'll try to make it seem like it's about orthodoxy it's about faithfulness to uh, the book of discipline uh you know all of the things but when it comes right down to it it's it's around including and loving though some i've heard people say well we want to love everybody but this is what the bible says there were there are people saying that jesus says that marriage is between a man and a woman there's all kinds of misquoting and misusing of scripture and i'm going to use this opportunity to put in just another plug um for anybody who's listening who's confused or wants to know is is maybe in the middle of this struggle yourself please go read the book walking the bridgeless canyon by kathy balduck please 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 go read this book walking the bridgeless canyon um this book will take you through the history of when um right-wing christianity became again became um very homophobic it will you know talk about when homophobic language was added to the bible again added um and it'll walk you through when and how this became a political issue because it's not a historically uh christian one um and it it very much is meant for you to come out hating people. So if you are want to please do the work and read the book, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. And that, that it was interesting to be thinking about this scripture that so often in verse six says, you know, they, they equate Jesus saying, I am the way and the mm-hmm. truth and the life and that I'm the only way also gets attached to the political agenda that yeah. says there is this way so so you know sometimes it's fear we we're afraid of people who might see the world differently than we do it's Can i share a quote power- yeah please um this quote is by the reverend dr elizabeth johnson who is from the lutheran institute of theology in meganga cameroon and this is what she says about that verse Unfortunately, this verse has often been used as a trump card or worse as a threat to tell people that they better get with the program and accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior in order to be saved. To interpret the verse this way is to rip it from its context and to do violence to the spirit of Jesus's words. Amen to that. That's that's good words. I Yeah, that's. um. I, it, it hit me really hard in in a way to hear that um, that language too, and just understanding like this is exactly what it does. That the, the think of the violence that this Bible verse has caused when interpreted that way. Well, and yeah, and if we look at how Je- the how Jesus moved through the world, his way of loving and calming troubled hearts and welcoming. Mm-hmm. and healing and calling and drawing out gifts and ministry that way is what got him it was challenging to the powers who be who who want to solidify their power and so you know to start this out again with jesus saying to them uh don't let your hearts be troubled you know you know me we've been loving this we've been learning and loving so so something i'm going to add to what you're saying right here do not let your hearts be troubled um a fun thing um in the greek so do not let your so plural right that's it's it's multiple people but it's actually one heart it's do not let your plural heart singular um be troubled which is an interesting um you know sort of play on words by the author of understanding that like um, you know, this, this combined heart of, 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 you know, Christian unity or, you know, that like it's, it's one heart. We have one heart. And uh, yeah, it's sort of a communal and to the degree that we love in community, Mm -hmm. which, which that, you know, we can draw a connecting to both of our, to the ELCA and to the, a lot of the church denominations in, to the degree that politics has taken our a lot of our culture into individualistic and personal salvation and yeah. between me and Jesus, uh, 
this, you know, this, what you were just saying talks about, I think Jesus is laying out here that we're, we think communally, communitarianly and loving through that. That's a powerful witness. Yeah. Um, and that's also really consistent with the gospel of John and the listeners have heard that before, um, that like, we're, we're all in this together, right? It's not ever, it's, it's not your individual. Um, it's, um, especially those that have listened to me, uh, preaching congregations, I make a real big deal about this many, 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 most pretty much all the times when it says you something, something in the Bible, it's never a singular. It's always a, you all it's plural that that doesn't translate well into English. And so when we read it in English, we can see the singular, but it's not singular. It is plural in the Greek. It is always a, you all that we are in this together. And like Jesus came to save the cosmos. It is, it is a plurality. It's the whole world. We are in this together. It's not meant to be an individual thing. And so when you start to look at everything of sort of like, hey, we're all, we, we are, we are one heart. We are in this together. We are saved in our plurality together by Jesus. Okay. Everyone's included in that, right? Like these people are also included in that. They're also made in God's image, right? So like, we're reading it wrong if we're starting to set boundaries where people are on the outside of these gifts of grace, right? Which is one of the motivations that excites me about actually our collaboration effort. It mm-hmm. feels community because it's so tempting. You know, I think when our when our denominations get a, feel a little bit of fear, we kind of, and as communities, whatever, we always kind of want to circle the wagons and protect our own and so uh the inv- to go in a campus ministry approach to be welcoming so we try to find as many ways to love the community We're, you know some campus ministries want to brag about how big they are or or all that kind of stuff and it feels like that's really individual oriented and not what Jesus is talking about to, to learn how to love. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Jesus didn't like, really lay out this plan where you're like, oh yeah, how many butts in the seats can we get? Anytime you're looking at yeah. church like that, you've missed the point of what's happening. We we uh, had put out in front of our campus ministry building rainbow banners for a number of times. They kept getting stolen. Mm-hmm. We, we were choosing to interpret that, that there were people that were proud of the rainbow and we were happy to decorate their rooms, but I don't know if that was the case <laughs> or not. So we decided to paint our front steps. We had just the right amount of steps to have uh, the rainbow mm-hmm. steps. And it's still amazing to me, the people that will say, I'm afraid to go up those steps or that, you know, it's like somehow afraid they're afraid because they might become part of the LGBT community, or we might be a church that's only. Oh, sure. That's how that works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of that. I mean, that's obviously not, Mm -hmm. but, but my experience has been uh, a whole lot of the church has spent trying to be exclusionary and anything we can do to show welcome and love, uh, so for the people who are looking for a place to be welcomed, maybe a rainbow flag or a Black Lives Matter or an ELCA denominational logo on the front of our building or a Methodist or whatever, you know, uh, yeah, it might be scary, but you might find that you have a community here and mm-hmm. we can help get through. I mean, do you have an ELCA that, logo out in front of the building? We We do. The, we the, we, uh, we always uh, joke called the gay soccer ball. <laughs> so now you can we think about a, that every day when you see it, when you walk in. Nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah. We have, a, we we're our partnerships have been with particular congregations, mm-hmm. but, but we have a denominational logo from each of our collaborative partners. Awesome. Because that might reach out, you know, somebody might say, okay, I recognize that. And I'm feeling pretty scared as a, student and i might find a place that i'm welcome there yeah which i think is sort and of what I, jesus to, is saying to the disciples yeah and to me also seeing those different things on the same building says oh these these people think bigger than themselves um you know that they're that they 
want to be a part of what it means to work together as Christians in this movement, um, that it means to be disciples and that it's not meant to divide, it's meant to unite. That's what I hear. I, you're right, maybe a freshman in college isn't thinking that deeply, but um, that's what I would see when I would see all those on the side of, of the three house. And so we try to put ourselves in places uh, where people can see that we're loving mm -hmm. in the style of Jesus and not talking just about personal salvation. Yeah. You know, there's the preachers that come through and call names and stand out sure. outside of the union. Mm -hmm. We try to show, show up and be a witness that says, you know, you're welcome. You're seen, you're loved. Yeah. The, the whole, which again, I feel like that's what the image, some of the movement, some of the Christian exclusion is they're trying for everybody to get their ticket to heaven punched. And what we're saying is, I think Jesus is saying that's already taken care of. Let's, let's worry about loving our world. Yeah, I totally agree. Thanks, Dave, for joining us um, on this episode. Um, thanks for sharing about ministry um, and also um, about the hard stuff that's going on um, with some United Methodist Church stuff right now. But we appreciate you. having you. This has been a so cool, AJ, to have known you when you were starting in ministry <laughs> and exploring yeah. that and thinking, wait, can I even do that? What? I thought I was going to be a business person or something. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and now you're doing cool, cool ministry through this podcast. Thank yeah. you for the invitation. I'm happy to have you. All right. Well, um, everyone, take care. Um, as always, remember that you can learn more about the 10 Foot Pole Podcast by going to 10 com, finding us on Facebook and Instagram and wherever you listen to podcasts. And the 10 Foot Pole Podcast is a ministry of the Delaware, Maryland Synod. To learn more, go to demdsynod.org. Take care.